it's fantastic to see so many people, so many friends here, uh, our incredible honorees, their families, friends of this law school, tons of alumni, uh, enormous number of distinguished guests, and of course, students and my colleagues. So what a weekend, a time when we recognize and celebrate those who have built and continue to shape our profession. And our profession is evolving constantly. It's evolving to meet the standards of an increasingly complex, connected, and diverse world. Indeed, we've had a hand or two in provoking that change. Let me begin by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. We're gathered today with friends and colleagues spanning generations of memories, of achievements, of engagement at this college to celebrate three alumni, our 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award winners. At moments like this, we seek to define and summarize the contributions of individuals over the course of their respective lives. For the three people we honor today, that would be a very long list indeed. What I hope you come away with after hearing more about today's honorees is not only their service to our profession and our communities and their communities, but the way that each enthusiastically and consistently has worked to advocate on behalf of others. There is no higher calling as an attorney than the role of advocate, to speak for those who may not be able to speak for themselves. Tonight's honorees serve as outstanding examples of this quality, which I believe is at the heart of our profession. Bob Hirsch, has shown us that you can have a legendary legal career while fulfilling the core tenet advocacy of our profession. Throughout his career, Bob has been a nationally renowned and innovative criminal defense attorney. And you would be hard pressed to find another attorney that has devoted as many years of his life for fighting for the rights of others. As a legal practitioner, Bob has embodied advocacy by passionately defending clients from all walks of life, in both private practice and in public service, through his deeply held belief that everyone is entitled to the best representation possible. Bob's remarkable career as an advocate is unparalleled, and we're proud to honor his service to the profession. Judge Peggy Houghton is an equity trailblazer who dedicated her life to advocacy. When it comes to advocating for the interests of women in law, Judge Houghton has long been at the vanguard, having been a founder in women's groups at Arizona Law, in addition to serving as the first woman Superior Court Commissioner in Pima County. Judge Houghton also served as an advocate for the interests of children and families as a Superior Court judge, where she utilized the law as a tool to help everyone who came through her courtroom. Outside of the law, she has worked with many organizations dedicated to serving the interests of women and children. We are proud to honor Judge Hatton and her incomparable legacy of advocacy today. Finally, this brings us to the multifaceted career of Daisy Jenkins. 
As with our two other honorees, a core characteristic of Daisy's career has been advocacy. Like a diamond, Daisy's accomplishments shine in all directions. Attorney, corporate vice president, entrepreneur, novelist. Daisy's advocacy for the importance of diversity and inclusion in the world of corporate law was critical and necessary, was and is. However, Daisy's legacy of advocacy extends far beyond her professional accomplishments. She's been a tireless champion for African-American students in Tucson, working with Tucson Public Schools, the University of Arizona, and other local organizations in furtherance of these interests. For this work, she has been recognized time and again as a community leader. We are incredibly fortunate to call Daisy as an alumna, and we celebrate her achievements today. So before I cede the podium to Andy Silverman and the members of the awards committee who will conduct the rest of tonight's program, let me acknowledge that we are fortunate to have many previous Lifetime Achievement Award winners in our midst. And you can wander down this hallway as students do every day. This is the heart of our college. And wandering down that hallway every day, you see the picture students stop, they read the stories. So, uh, so it's dangerous because this is a packed room and I didn't have a chance to say hello to everyone. I saw some prior winners, um, uh, Judge McNamee, uh, Dee Dee Samet uh, uh, was here, Lynn Duesenberg. I, so I'm gonna stop because I can only get in trouble if I try and do, but what I am gonna do is ask anyone who is here and a previous Lifetime Achievement Award winner, please to stand. Looking around now, uh, awesome set of uh, alumni, and I'm glad I didn't try and pick out everyone because uh, <laughs> I would have missed. Uh, look, so today we're honoring all our award recipients, the past recipients who are here, thank you, and the recipients we will hear more about today, recognizing the invaluable contributions to our community and to our profession. With that, Andy. Wow, what a wonderful crowd. I didn't realize that Daisy, Bob, and uh, Peggy had so many family and friends. God, I thought it would be just a little group. No, I'm just kidding, yeah. Um, as uh, Mark indicated, um, I'm one of the members of the Lifetime Achievement Award Committee, along with Barbara Atwood, Mona Email, Melissa, Tatum and Megan O'Leary, who is chair. And again, on behalf of the committee, I want to welcome you all and appreciate all of you uh, joining us today. The Lifetime Achievement Award was the brainchild of former law school dean Roger Henderson. Roger felt that the faculty should establish an award to recognize law school alums who have distinguished themselves. Thus, Roger presented the idea to the faculty, which enthusiastically adopted it. In order for an alum to be eligible for the war, he or she must have graduated from the law school at least 25 years ago. Is that right, Bob, 25 years ago? I think so. The award recognizes alums who have had distinguished and exemplary careers in the practice of law, doing public service, or working in higher education. The faculty in making its decision looks at such things as the candidate's contribution to the legal profession, support for public causes and law reform and commitment to the pursuit of justice. In order to be a selected for the award, two thirds of the faculty must vote in favor of the candidate. As Mark mentioned in the hallway uh, to my left here, you can see the plaques recognizing the awardees. With the three awardees that are being recognized today, there are 50 alums who have received the award since its inception in 1998. 
The Lifetime Achievement Award is the highest recognition that the law faculty can bestow upon an alum. Well, it's my pleasure, uh, in addition to uh, saying a few words about the Lifetime Achievement Awards, to um, introduce uh, Bob Hirsch. Steve Sherrick, a longtime criminal defense attorney who worked with Bob uh, for eight years, describes Bob as demanding, inspiring, funny, now, the next word he, is his word, annoying, <laughs> brilliant, and very human. When I asked various criminal defense attorneys about Bob, these were the kinds of descriptive words I heard. Steve went on to say, Bob was able to achieve remarkable results about seemingly overwhelming circumstances. Another longtime criminal defense lawyer and former state bar president, Mike Picaretta, told me, although Bob was known for his skill at trial, one of his strongest aspects was his compassion for his clients and his unwavering loyalty to them. Bob was a mentor to many, many lawyers. Steve said, working with Bob made me a much better lawyer. Mike indicated how lucky he was to be associated with Bob and able to observe him in the courtroom and in other settings. After many years of being a private criminal defense lawyer, Bob finished his career in the public sector, serving at, as the Pima County public defender as well as other positions. David Eichner, an attorney in the public defender's office said, Bob mentored a new generation of young criminal defense lawyers who were in the public defender's office. Mike concluded his comments about Bob by saying, Bob was a criminal defense master and was one of the leading, if not the leading criminal defense lawyer in the United States. Even though Bob is now retired, his impact on the practice of criminal defense work is still being felt. David put it this way, a decade after retiring from the public defender's office, Bob's impact and influence is still felt in the halls of the office and in the courthouse. It's my pleasure and honor at this time to present one of the top lawyers whoever graduated from this law school and my friend, Bob Hirsch. Come on, Bob. So this is the plaque that will be hanging in the uh, hallway here. Just a second, Bob. Go ahead. Okay. And so let me read it to you of uh, the inscription on the plaque. Robert Bob Hirsch was one of the leading criminal offense attorneys in Arizona for many years. Thank you. And is described as a champion of the underdog and a justice fighter who sees the best in people and believes that everyone is entitled to the best representation possible. Hirsch was born in Chamokin a small mining town in central Pennsylvania. He could have become a miner. <laughs> the youngest Sorry, of three it's children. It's only my fellow Shemokanites. <laughs> That's what they call us, Shemokanites. Sounds good. In 1945, when Hirsch was 10, his family moved to Tucson. He served in the army and upon his return from a tour in Germany, he attended the University of Arizona completing his degree in business administration in 1960. He then went on to the UA Law School, graduating in 1964. He worked for 45 years as a criminal defense attorney in private practice. He was an enormously talented and effective trial lawyer, commanding the courtroom with his intelligence and persuasive resolve. Many important and sometimes notorious clients came his way from members of the mafia to volunteers of the sanctuary movement. 
you can figure out what your notorious. Um, through one of his cases, he gained national prominence in his use of the insanity defense. Some of his cases became the subject of popular books. Upon retirement from a successful private practice, Hirsch joined the Pima County Public Defender's Office, where he provided leadership and inspiration for a cadre of young attorneys. He served as Pima County's public defender from 2005 to 2012. He's most proud of this per period in his career where he had the opportunity to effectively advocate for criminal justice reform. Hirsch's honors include his, I love this, his three children and four grandchildren. He received the Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice Vanguard Leadership Award, the Tom Karras Criminal Justice Award, the Pima County Bar Association's Robert Hooker Criminal Justice Award, and the University of Arizona Alumni Association's Professional Achievement Award. Hirsch is a founding member and former president of the Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice and is a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers. I present to you, Bob Hirsch. Well, that was, that was really so nice there. I don't know what to say. It was tough, Bob, but we figured it out. <laughs> You're right, I can figure it out. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can, it's, hard to, it's hard to say something in the heels of all of that. But thank you very much. I'm really honored to to receive this award. I'm honored to be here in front of all of you. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, 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 I never imagined that ever. You know, all I wanted to do was go to law school and hope to God I graduated and hope to God that, uh, you know, I'd be able to uh, uh, become a, a, a lawyer at one time or another. And uh, those are pretty uh, modest ambitions back in the old days, but it did happen to me. And, and uh, uh, it, it has been a real opportunity and an opportunity for myself in terms of growth and in terms of really helping people. Because when I think back on the cases that I've had, uh, I have helped people. I have done some right, some good things. I don't mean by going in and uh, kicking some prosecutor's ass. I'm talking about, uh, about really helping uh, other human beings uh, to uh, uh, to improve the quality of their life in some manner or fashion. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Uh, Paul. And, uh, uh, I don't have anything more to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Well, it's going to go on the wall here. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I, I, feel like I could take it home. Take okay. it home. No, all the law students need to read this. Okay. Thank uh, you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Atwood. I'm on the faculty, and I'm uh, really, really honored to be able to introduce to you Judge Margaret Houghton, whom I've known for almost 50 years. Um, Peggy, as her friends and family call her, um, is an amazing person, and we're excited to be able to give her this award tonight and I was thinking what would be the way to describe her and four adjectives that I came up with are resilient, daring, compassionate, and wise. So let me tell you why I think those are the words that are right. When Peggy was 10 years old she contracted polio and she became paralyzed. She was placed in a, the children's ward of a hospital where her parents could visit her once a week for one hour. She recalls a doctor doing grand rounds 
telling his colleagues, this one will never walk again. Peggy decided then and there to prove him wrong. She left the hospital after four months, walking with forearm crutches. That same core resilience and bravery seemed to have shaped her entire life. I met Peggy on a hot August day in 1973, both of us nervous first year law students at this law school, but it wasn't this beautiful building. It was a kind of weird building on Park Avenue. <laughs> we became fast friends despite our different backgrounds and different circumstances. I was single and unencumbered. She was married with teenage children at home, both of whom are here tonight, Pam and Rick. No longer teenagers, but still great people. But we were both deeply interested in women's rights. Uh, this was at a, an era when uh, the number of women attending law school uh, had leaped sort of weirdly across the United States, and we were almost a third of the uh, incoming class. We soon learned that the only women's organization at the law school was something called Barrister's Biddies. Oh. Well, it was a group of girlfriends and wives um, of law students who brought snacks and sandwiches and that sort of thing during exams. These were lovely women, truly. I mean, I don't want to disparage them, but we knew there should be a different organization. <laughs> So she and I and numerous other stalwart women formed the Law Women's Association to bring in speakers addressing questions of gender equality, domestic violence prevention, the marital rape exemption, which still was the law in Arizona at that time, and other women's issues. After law school, Peggy and others took the next logical step and founded the Arizona Women Lawyers Association, today a thriving statewide organization. In her professional life, as you will hear when I read the inscription on the plaque, Peggy achieved many firsts. She also has been a tireless advocate for women and children. I wanna mention a couple of things that aren't on the plaque. During her 16 year judicial career, uh, along with serving as presiding judge for both the family court bench and the probate bench, she was involved in extensive law reform efforts, including the drafting of new child support guidelines, which is an incredibly important area, domestic violence legislation, and regulations protecting the health insurance rights of dependent spouses. She was also a member of the State Bar's first gender bias task force in the 1990s, when people were just beginning to think about the subtle and not so subtle forms of sex discrimination within the profession. When Peggy was diagnosed with breast cancer years ago, she spoke openly and bravely about her reconstructive surgery and recovery and made public presentations about it to the Arizona Women Law Lawyers Association. She wanted to encourage women to take charge of their health and to make the right decisions about treatment. Since her retirement in 2000, she has continued her commitment to public service. This includes deep involvement with FAES, an organization that helps women who are entering the workplace for the first time. In addition, always a fierce advocate for reproductive rights. She has spoken over the years many times to a group called Medical Students for Choice about the history of reproductive rights in Arizona. I am not sure what one would say on that topic today. Uh, when Peggy and I started law school, Roe v. Wade had just been decided literally nine months before. This year's entering class of law students are starting their legal education with the demise of that decision. But that's another talk. 
After the death of her beloved husband, Bert Fallbaum, in 2015, she was brokenhearted. She was devastated. But just as she's done throughout her life, she picked herself up, moved forward, and lo and behold, she met a wonderful man, Paul Garner, and she fell in love again. So Peggy, resilient, daring, compassionate and wise, would you come forward? <laughs> so this is what's on the plaque honoring uh, my dear friend and our fabulous alum. Judge Margaret Peggy Houghton, a pathbreaker for women in the law, worked for the betterment of children and families throughout her career. Houghton was crippled by polio in childhood and denied access to higher education for social and economic reasons. She married, settled in Florida, had two children, and engaged in extensive volunteer work. Longing for more education, she began college in 1968 at a new junior college near her home. When she and her husband moved to Tucson, she attended the University of Arizona earning a Bachelor's of Arts with high distinction in anthropology in 1973. She was inducted into Phi Beta Kappa and Phi Kappa Phi. Her undergraduate honors thesis launched her active work in gender issues as she developed, surveyed, and compiled data for the official report, Male and Female Lawyers in Pima County. Does gender make a difference? The answer is yes. <laughs> Houghton entered the U of A College of Law in 1973 and became one of the founders of the Law Women's Association. After graduation in 1976, Houghton went on to co-found the Arizona Women Lawyers Association. She practiced law in Tucson for eight years before being appointed commissioner of the Pima County Superior Court, the first woman to hold that position. In 1989, <laughs> In 1989, Governor Rose Mockford appointed her judge of the Arizona Superior Court in Pima County Division 12, Division 17, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> judge Houghton served as the presiding domestic relations judge and later the presiding probate judge. Her real love was working with families whose problems brought them into the courtroom. Houghton accumulated an impressive record of public service she served on the boards of Planned Parenthood, Casa de los Niños, Child and Family Resources, and FAES. Always supportive of her alma mater, Houghton was president of and served on the Law College Board of Visitors. She was the first woman to be elected president of the Law College Association. She was a member of the U of A Centennial Committee Advisory Board and served on the U of A Honors College Board and the U of A College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Board. Houghton earned the YWCA Woman on the Move Award in 1984 and was honored by AWLA upon her retirement in 2000 by a dinner and a scholarship established in her name at the College of Law. By her direction, the scholarship benefits second year law students who are the primary caregiver of a dependent child and who demonstrate financial need. Congratulations, Peggy. Well, thank you very much. Adding to that, I have to say first, not my prepared remarks, but as a judge, I also survived having Bob Hirsch in my courtroom. <laughs> the trick was, Mr. Hirsch, please pick a seat that you like and sit in it. 
<laughs> oh, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> That's my little boy. <laughs> and you sign it. <laughs> thank you. you. Made me feel like a real judge, Bob. <laughs> All right. I want to thank Barbara and the dean and the law faculty. I'm going to start by quoting that great social philosopher, Alan Alda. <laughs> Alan Alda said that life is adapting, adjusting, and revising. So that's what I've been doing decade by decade. In my first decade, first decade, yeah, this is the first decade. Um, I was a little girl who loved school. I was a little bit bossy. Um, but that's the way little girls have to be. And we, yes, yes we are. Um, and I raised little girls to be bossy, so <laughs> that's okay. Um, I really wanted to be a ballet dancer. That was my second choice when I found out I couldn't be a princess. <laughs> But that decade ended with polio, which changed things. In my second decade, I went back to school on crutches. Uh, I ended with high school graduation, which was great in 1984, and a too early marriage in 1955. I have two lovely children, Pam and Rick. Um, and my goal during that second decade was to be a perfect wife, according to the Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> and a perfect mother, according to Dr. Spock. I flunked the perfect white thing. Uh, I divorced, and I'm still working on the perfect mother, I promise. <laughs> In my third decade, it was exciting to move to Tucson and to go to the University of Arizona. Um, and then I changed. I was going to be an anthropologist, but then a big change in goals as I studied, as Barbara said, uh, and I attended this law school, not this law school, that other building, um, and I was going to be a lawyer. That's a big change. That's a really big change, and it gave me a very different view on my role in society. In my fourth decade, I began practicing to be a lawyer. It was thrilling and scary. Like, where do you find the rule that tells you what an order to show cause is? Find it somewhere. <laughs> All right. um, my fifth decade. Another revision. Roger Henderson, who started this, and I'm very pleased, and he called to talk to me about this. Uh, just the other day, but he was exposed to the dread disease and he's isn't able to be here. But he was a former dean and a good friend. He suggested that I apply for that commissioner's position on the court. I really hadn't thought of that because I hadn't seen myself as being qualified to do anything as absolutely marvelous as sitting on, on the bench. And then a few years later, Governor Rose Malford, the the lady with the giant hairdo appointed me as judge. Sitting on the bench pushed me into a whole new world. Um, becoming a person with power to affect other people's lives is a real awesome thing that dawns on you rather slowly and you realize what you're doing. Sixth decade. No, finished. I do look to Alan Alda during that. I did adapt, adjust, and revise. And I joined the relatively small cohort of women judges, which keeps <coughs> growing. And I will tell you, they don't call us Judge X anymore. <laughs> I once called a judge out by a Maricopa County lawyer. Judge. Six decade. My alarm clock and I retired. Again, I adjusted slowly and revised. I needed jeans and tees instead of silk blouses and pantyhose. <laughs> Seventh decade. 
love and loss, joy and grief. I was able to travel the Northern Hemisphere in a cool little RV with my husband. And then I was able to travel the world by plane and by big sailboat. I was widowed twice in 10 years. There is no such thing as a merry widow. 10th decade. No, I'm not there yet. Oh my God, hey, hey, I got to do this for 20 more years, right? All right, eighth decade. Polio strikes back. I have mobility issues. That's what they call it now. And I was alone again then. And then I met a charming Englishman, Paul Garner. And in April, Barbara Atwood, in her other role as a judge, uh, married us on our on the terrace of our home. Each decade has required adapting, adjusting, and revising to meet new challenges. And now I add a new word, acceptance. Acceptance of the limitations of my aging body. I was a law student nearly 50 years ago, and my life was changed dramatically by moving from a home person and the ladies' home journal into being an attorney. And those years made me have new goals, and new ideas, and new friends. This honor, this Lifetime Achievement Award, has caused me to look back over my life thus far. Uh, successes. I passed the bar exam. <laughs> Failure. Someone else got appointed. <laughs> Six, uh, joy. Children and my stepchildren. Sadness of death and widowhood. Beginnings and new opportunities to learn. The endings, I swim a whole lot better than I walk. <laughs> and I'm not finished yet. There's a ninth decade ahead. I want to have a part in bringing peace and order to this world, which is so full of anger and pain. I want to keep the good, the beauty of our planet, and bring food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, and peace to the war-torn world. And the rule of law for everyone. I hope you've met my family, and I don't know whether they want to stand up, but together, you want to stand up? May I introduce you? Pam? Pan and Rick, and, uh, and the little one, but the little one is very mighty, very, very mighty. She was uh, she actually joined our family as a teenager when I was in law school. So I had three. It was it was a blessing, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> and then Bert Fallbaum's daughter, Daisy Fallbaum. And her wife, Deanie Guy. And my husband's daughter, Ariana Gardner. That's it. Well, every one of the stepchildren represents a cluster of people. Okay. My husband, Paul Gardner. Thank you. Oh, wow. They're actually special. They used to stand up when I walked in the room. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Mona Emel, and I'm also a member of the faculty here at the College of Law. 
And it is my great honor to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to um, Daisy Jenkins. Daisy, where are you? Where are you? Daisy once stated, I think if you behave like you, like you belong long enough, people will believe that you belong. <laughs> and so we know that for Daisy's career and, and her lifetime with her family, I have many, many examples of how she belongs. Um, I have there are the 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 list of achievements is is far beyond what I could give you in two to three minutes, and uh, but I would like to give you a couple quotes that contradict um, the idea that she was just hanging around. Um, one of her friends said. Um, and that her friend is here, um, Gail Dunlap, who I believe she's known for many, many years, said, Daisy is a mover and a shaker. And I think we could all agree with that. Another friend of hers, Louise Francesconi, I believe, uh, said, Daisy doesn't define how she contributes by job description, but contributes with her person, experience, and intellect. And I feel like reading through so many of her accomplishments, that that is a very accurate description of the way she approaches life. And yet, Many times in Daisy's career, she often felt left out or invisible, despite much evidence to the contrary today. But I certainly can relate, as I know many of us in our early years, to those feelings. However, her husband, who I believe is also here, <laughs> Once said, she doesn't like to take no for an answer. <laughs> Once she got to the top, she wasn't happy to be the only black up there. She reached back and pulled others up as well. And I think that epitomizes Daisy's career. However, I'm going to read in a moment the many, many accolades that I get believe that they could fit on the plaque <laughs> of this extraordinary and amazing and inspirational woman. But ultimately, I, I, I feel like Daisy is the kind of person who has strived to live one day at a time, to enjoy one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. And with that philosophy, how can this woman be anything other than an inspiration to all of us? Now, I happened to be teaching, she, she was a 3L my first year of teaching, but I remember her. And if she wants her award, I found this 1997. <laughs> it's a 1997 directory. And it has her phone number and her address. 
and where she works. <laughs> and so if she wants her award, I will read this out to everyone <laughs> unless she makes her way up to the podium. <laughs> Not that any of it is playing. <laughs> I will give this to you. So at this time, um, I would like to take a moment to read what is on the inscription. Daisy Jenkins, attorney community leader, entrepreneur, and author, has been a path breaker throughout her professional life. She holds a bachelor's and a master's in communication from the University of Hawaii. Jenkins received her JD from the James E. Rogers College of Law in 1996, focusing on corporate law and employment law. Starting as a clerk at then Hughes Aircraft Company, Jenkins climbed the ranks to vice president of human resources. She was from Hughes to Raytheon, Raytheon Company's first director of global diversity at the global headquarters of Massachusetts. And in 2000 became the first woman of color to hold the position of vice president in the company's 70 year history. Jenkins served the company for 29 years before moving to Carondelet Health Network where she was chief administrative and human resources officer from 2010 to 2013. Since 2013, she has been the president of Daisy Jenkins and Associates LLC, a business consulting firm specializing in human resource, wait, human resource services and expertise, executive and development coaching, and customized solutions for her clients. Jenkins is also a senior advisor to the Theo Executive Group in Irvine, Texas. In addition to, excuse me, where am I? In addition um, to, excuse me, to her professional achievements, now we get to all the awards, um, Jenkins has been a leader in the community service organization and has been dedicated, a dedicated advocate for the African-American student achievement. Her affiliation includes the U of A Foundation Board of Trustees, Southern Arizona African-American Museum Board of Directors, UA President's Black Community Council, and the Tucson Unified School District African-American Advisory Council. She is also a member of the law colleges, the College of Laws Board of Visitors. Jenkins, a prolific author, to say the least, has published three novels and numerous articles for local and national magazines. Jenkins has been honored by many institutions, including it's more. <laughs> the 2019 Spirit of Philanthropy Award from the UA College of Humanities, the 2015 Si Se Puede Legacy Award from the Arizona Cesar Chavez Holiday Coalition, the Phenomenal Woman of the Year Award from the UA Black Alumni Association, the two that aren't, aren't you getting tired? I mean, the 2007 Woman of the Year from the Tucson Chamber of Commerce, the 2001 
James E. Rogers Distinguished Alumna Award. And most recently, she in 2022, she was recognized in an issue of Biz Tucson magazine as one of the women leading the region. She was also recognized, this is the last one, <laughs> as, one, as one of the African-American women top in corporate America. Yeah. And this was published in the Ebony Magazine. Jenkins, on the other hand, is devoted to her family and her church community. She and her husband, Fred Jenkins Jr. have two sons and 12 grandchildren. So the plaque with the award, the award took up everything, I'm afraid. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thank you so much, Mona, for that very kind and lengthy introduction. <laughs> I feel so, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. I feel so incredibly blessed to be here today receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations to my fellow honorees, Bob Hirsch and Judge Peggy Houghton. What a privilege to be among such accomplished individuals and all of the past honorees. Thank you to the faculty, Dean Miller, and all who contributed to selecting me for this incredible honor. I thank my awesome husband of 56 years, Fred Jenkins, the most amazing supporter of all my endeavors. <laughs> I thank all of my family, my sons and grandchildren, extended family, friends, my incredible village that's here today. It's truly a blessing to be surrounded by people who have your best interests at heart and are always there when you need them. And lastly, but certainly not least, I thank my God for being at the, at the center of my life and for the wisdom he continuously imparts to me. My law school experience has been priceless. It has added a level of clarity and boldness to my advocacy for the rights of the disenfranchised and the marginalized. Having started my corporate career as the lowest level clerk, more highly degreed than any of my managers at the time. <laughs> and I know what it's like to be denied opportunities for growth. Having to continuously prove that I had intelligence, could think, generate solutions and be a solid contributor to that bottom line. Always under the microscope and often the only woman and person of color in a room full of executives, knowing that my presence and my contributions impacted the hiring of more people who looked like me. As I climbed the corporate ladder, <laughs> okay, we're gonna get through this. <laughs> As I climbed the corporate ladder, I met women and people of color with tremendous talent relegated to entry level positions solely because of their gender, uh, the color of their skin. And law school helped me to take that raw emotion out of my advocacy 
but never losing the passion and to speak boldly with intentionality that has led to positive change in many areas. Now, I always hoped and prayed that my sons and my grandchildren would never experience the challenges of racism and sexism that I face. But oh, the nightmare continues. I want so much for Che, Kevin, Jaden, Linnea, and all of my grandchildren to enjoy a life of fulfilled dreams and not have to worry about being marginalized because of their gender and color of their skin. But today still brings those challenges. Voting rights are under attack. With voter suppression, and intimidation. A woman's right to choose is being trampled upon. Unequal access to quality education from preschool to college. And national leaders have the unmitigated gall to condemn human rights and humanitarian abuses in other countries when justice is still elusive to men and women of color as our prisons. As our prisons are disproportionately filled with black and brown faces. Now my advocacy for increased enrollment of black law students continues as the percentage of black lawyers decline nationally when they are most needed. A June 2022 poll shows that 81% of active lawyers are white, while only 4.7% are black. This is the same percentage for 10 years. And I appreciate that Dean Miller and his recruitment team have actively engaged me in the law school's recruitment and admission processes. The opportunity to reach out to admitted Black students and encourage them to come to Arizona is so important. Assuring them of a support system like attorney Richard Davis who held study sessions at his home when I was a law student and still actively support students. So the struggle continues. And because of that, my commitment continues to uplift those who don't have their wings and those whose wings have been clipped and they can't fly on their own. Equally important, Always, always be a champion for kindness, civility, and love for all humankind. Thank you and God bless. So there is precious close to nothing I could say after those powerful comments and celebrations from, from all of our honorees. What amazing human beings. Thank you. Very brief thanks. One to the Lifetime Achievement Awards Committee. These awards, your letting us honor you and recognize your careers matters. I've talked, you've heard it before. This, your careers, your beliefs, your words shape the views of the awesome students who continue to come here and learn the law. And so it is an incredibly powerful way to continue to shape the world that comes. The committee, you've heard 
uh, from several of them tonight, uh, Barb Ratwood, Mona Mel, Andy Silverman, Melissa Tatum, uh, and it's chaired by uh, Megan uh, O'Leary, who is here as well. I want to thank uh, the faculty who this evening did the introductions as well, uh, to Kate Osterhold and our alumni and development team. Uh, and finally, uh, to all of you, it, it is so powerful for me and for us to see the community come out in, in honor of amazing individuals, but also to remind us how important law and legal education is. Thank you all for being here. Have a great night.